a PowerPoint presentation. Logo, Ties Center. Text, Professional Learning Group Series. Building Inclusive Education Systems for All Students, Session 3. Prioritizing Teaching and Learning. Amy Howley, EDD and Deborah Telfer, Ph.D. This webinar is the third in a series about what it takes for districts to be effective in their practice of inclusive instructional and organizational leadership. I am Deborah Telfer, Director of the University of Cincinnati's Systems Development and Improvement Center, SDI Center for short. Our center is one of the partners in the TIES Project, the National Technical Assistance Center on Inclusive Practices and Policies. In this webinar, we focus on the whys and the hows of prioritizing teaching and learning in school districts and their schools. She changes the slide. Sticky notes with the word, why, on them. Let's start with an overview of the whys. Two common sense ideas that often get lost in the mix of everyday life in school districts provide a basis for thinking about why it is important to prioritize teaching and learning. First is the fact that the central mission of schools and districts is teaching and learning. Second is the fact that learning is the basis for improvement in everything we do. She changes the slide. A humanoid scratches their head as they stand on a path that is branching off in five directions. Text, why number one? It almost goes without saying that teaching and learning define the central mission of schools and school districts. But the reminder is important. School districts, like many other organizations, are responsive to what some organizational theorists call mission creep. Mission creep happens when an organization starts with a clear mission and then takes on work that diverts its original mission. In a 2014 article, Jonker and Meehan note, mission creep can stretch an organization so thin and so far that it can no longer effectively pursue its goals. She changes the slide. A magnifying glass over a building. Text, the opposite of mission creep is focus. Over the course of the 20th century and into the 21st century, school districts have been pressured to add more and more to their mission. Pressure comes from communities, state government, businesses, and the federal government. Here are a few examples. 1. Fighting drug use. 2. Winning state athletic championships. And 3. Preparing youth to become entrepreneurs. These goals seem worthy, of course, and that's why school districts so easily fall prey to mission creep. Educators believe schools can take on more and more work. But like all organizations, when schools add new things to the mission, they cut back on the things they're already doing. And what they are already doing might turn out to be their most important work. For schools and districts, the most important work involves the teaching and learning of key academic content, the content students need for life as engaged citizens and self-sustaining participants in the workforce. She changes the slide. A picture of students sitting in desks all crowded together. Text, why number two? Now let's look at the second why. The fact that educational organizations should be learning organizations. She changes the slide. A chart shows an orange arrow that says input, a blue box that says learning, then an orange arrow that says output. A green box attached to the orange arrows says data-based improvement processes. Text, educational organizations as learning organizations. Organizations that use ongoing and systematic data-based improvement processes are what Peter Senge calls learning organizations. Senge came to his insights about learning organizations by observing businesses. Some prioritize learning more than others, and those that prioritize learning made the most improvement. Prioritizing learning through explicit work to become a learning organization might be even more important for schools and school districts, and also colleges and universities, than it is for businesses. As noted earlier, learning is central to the mission of schools and school districts. She changes the slide. Students look at a faceless teacher at the front of the room. It would certainly be ironic if leaders of educational organizations didn't model learning in their daily work. But that situation sometimes happens. By contrast, when the adults at the top of an organization model learning, 
It has a powerful and positive effect on everyone else's learning. Learning is how organizations build individual and collective capacity. And the bottom line for educational organizations is this. When adults focus on learning, it helps students focus on learning. She changes the slide. Two rainbow-colored head silhouettes face each other. Text, turn and talk number one. Now might be a good time to turn off the video and talk with your colleagues about the extent to which your district or state focuses most of its energy on an academic mission. Use the questions below to guide your discussion. What are the most significant academic priorities in your district or state? What evidence supports your thinking? What other priorities seem to get in the way of your district's or state's focus on academic priorities? Why do you think that is happening? She changes the slide. Sticky notes with the word, how, on them. Text, overview of the hows. School districts that prioritize teaching and learning use four sets of practices. They are, one, focus goals and strategies. Two, involve administrators as lead learners. Three, provide staff with multiple opportunities to learn. And four, provide resources to support relevant professional learning. We will spend some time looking at what each of these sets of practices entails. She changes the slide. Text, how number one. Focus goals and strategies. Let's start with practices that help a district establish, communicate, and promote a limited set of district goals and strategies that focus on the improvement of teaching and learning. This work often starts when a district defines its vision, mission, and core values. Framing these statements about the district as non-negotiables communicates the strength of the district's commitment to them. She changes the slide. Then, she reads the mission, which is in an orange box. An illustration might help show what strong non-negotiables look like. Let's say a district has the following mission statement. Our school district has a dual focus on academic excellence and equity. We hold high academic expectations for every student and every group of students. Our commitment to nurture every student means that we work to ensure that every student feels a sense of belonging and every student has the supports he or she needs in order to succeed. This mission means that the district envisions a future in which there is higher achievement overall and reduced achievement gaps for students from marginalized subgroups. It also implicates core values such as support for engagement with academic content and honoring diverse backgrounds and perspectives. Non-negotiables in this district might focus on the practices that enact the district's vision, mission, and core values. Some non-negotiables might be these. The district uses the core curriculum as the basis for educating every child. The district provides whatever scaffolds a child needs in order to make meaningful progress with academic content. The district requires the use of person-first language. She changes the slide. A light bulb on a chalkboard. Six lines are drawn around the light bulb in white chalk, and a white circle is drawn at the end of each line. These non-negotiables help the district identify and then focus effort and resources to accomplish a small and coherent set of goals by using a small and coherent set of strategies. She changes the slide. A humanoid holding their head and leaning on a large red question mark. Achieving this degree of focus sometimes requires a district's educators to change their beliefs. Not all educators in the district, for instance, may believe that students with disabilities or students living in poverty can make meaningful progress with academic content. Changing individual beliefs and ultimately the district's collective beliefs about the capabilities of students from different groups may be needed in order to move forward with the district's mission. And changing beliefs is hard work. She changes the slide. Text, how number two. The second set of practices that helps a district prioritize teaching and learning is to involve administrators in the process of learning about instructional and intervention strategies that align closely with the district's goals. Administrators, in fact, need to function as lead learners 
by making visible efforts to improve their own skills and knowledge and to engage colleagues in meaningful discussions about teaching and learning. She changes the slide. The word, support, is spelled in Scrabble tiles, with blank tiles in the background. Text, supporting principals as instructional leaders. Being a lead learner at the district level also involves visible efforts to promote the instructional leadership of building principals. They do so by, one, providing principals with high quality, evidence-based professional development to build their competence as instructional leaders, two, giving principals autonomy to implement inclusive instructional leadership in ways that fit their school context, and three, supporting principals' efforts to cultivate teachers' collaborative learning. She changes the slide. Two rainbow-colored head silhouettes face each other. Text, turn and talk number two. Now might be a good time to stop the video and share thoughts with a partner or several partners. Use the questions below to guide your conversation. To what extent do principals in your district practice instructional leadership? What support might the district provide to help each principal act as the lead learner in his or her school? What tasks might the district reassign to other personnel so that principals have time to do the work of instructional leadership. She changes the slide. Four pictogram men around a boardroom table. One wears a suit and points at a graph showing increasing bars. Blue gears are shown in the middle of the table. Text, management often crowds out instructional leadership. If your conversation with colleagues showed that the district isn't supporting instructional leadership as much as you would like, you are not alone. This situation is very common. Principals have a huge number of responsibilities, and management tasks can end up taking a great deal of time. Districts can help by reducing the management burden on principals and by providing professional development and coaching that helps principals learn to focus on the tasks that have the greatest impact on teaching and learning at their schools. She changes the slide. Text, how number three, provide staff with multiple opportunities to learn. The third set of practices for prioritizing teaching and learning relates to the professional development that the district makes available to staff. The bottom line is that the district needs to make a lot of meaningful and sustained opportunities available. Meaningful professional development addresses what personnel believe will help them in their jobs. Sustained professional development provides enough support to enable staff to do things differently not just learn about the different things they should do. She changes the slide. District leaders may wonder what practices they should use to build meaningful and sustained professional development. As it turns out, research on educational improvement shows that five practices are particularly useful. These involve, first, creating structures for system-wide learning. These structures enable educators within and across schools to learn from one another. Second, providing opportunities for practice because almost all learning requires repeated practice. Third, ensuring that job embedded professional development is directly related to the identified instructional practices chosen for improvement. In other words, making sure that PD is relevant. Fourth, differentiating support across the system. Not all educators need the same amount or the same kind of support for learning new instructional or leadership skills. Finally, providing all educators with high-quality coaching. Coaching is a critical scaffold to support and sustain professional learning. In fact, an increasing body of research is showing that coaching is the crux of high-quality professional development. Without coaching, PD is less likely to work. She changes the slide. A photo of students in a classroom, half of whom have raised hands, as does the teacher. Text, all means all. To make teaching and learning a district's top priority, district leaders need to take steps to break down the hierarchical view of the district organization, in which some are presumed to be experts, while others are presumed to be novices. In learning organizations, everyone is an expert in some ways, and everyone is a novice in some ways. Learning organizations work best when everyone is a learner. She changes the slide. 
a highway in the desert. A green road sign shows arrows pointing in all directions, each one is labeled, right way. Text, unpacking a difficult concept. What does it mean to provide a differentiated system of support? Differentiation is something that tends to be difficult across the board. Differentiating instruction for the students in a classroom is difficult, and differentiating support for adults in a school district is difficult. In both contexts, differentiation is a critical strategy for supporting teaching and learning. Even if it's difficult, it's worth the effort. Whether it focuses on children's learning or adults' learning, the fundamental premise of differentiation is to provide options. Not all individuals, classrooms, schools, or districts are the same. They all need support of different types and different levels of intensity. In relationship to PD, different types of learning might involve reading, watching videos, writing in a reflective journal, or engaging in discussions with colleagues. Different intensities of learning might relate to how much coaching an educator needs as he or she works to master a new skill. She changes the slide. Text, provide high quality job embedded PD. Several of the characteristics of PD that we've talked about so far contribute to its quality. Are there other quality indicators that are also important? Using a list of quality indicators provided by Linda Darling Hammond and two colleagues, we can check off to see what we've talked about already and what we still need to discuss. Here's the list. It also seems important to add one more indicator to Darling Hammond's list. We just mentioned it above, the fact that high quality PD is differentiated. Altogether, the indicators are, incorporates coaching, is sustained, is differentiated, supports collaboration, provides opportunities for reflection, is content focused, incorporates active learning, models effective practices, offers feedback. She changes the slide. Text, quality indicators. Several of the indicators were explicitly mentioned earlier in the webinar. These targeted coaching, sustained effort, and differentiation. The webinar also alluded to two others, supporting collaboration and providing opportunities for reflection. Four other indicators on the list are important as well, but they haven't been mentioned so far. These relate to content focus, active learning, modeling of effective practices, and offering feedback. By content focused, researchers mean that PD needs to be directly connected to what educators do. If a person teaches math, then high quality PD needs to relate to math teaching. For teachers, the phrase content focus is part of what the broader phrase job embedded is all about. We all learn through active processes, so active learning is also an important indicator. In addition, we all learn by observing examples. When PD instruction uses the very same instructional practices that the district values, it ends up teaching by showing as well as by telling. Often there's a disturbing mismatch, however, such as when a PD provider lectures about the values of active learning. One more important indicator involves providing feedback. We all need feedback in order to refine our use of new skills and practices. Coaches often provide feedback to the educators with whom they work, but self-rating checklists, rubrics, and peer observations are other useful methods through which educators can get feedback about how well they're performing new skills or practices. She changes the slide. Two rainbow colored head silhouettes face each other. Text, turn and talk number three. Stopping the video again and talking with colleagues will provide a chance for district leaders to evaluate the extent to which district PD fits with the nine indicators. Look at each indicator on the list below and quickly write down a rating of how well your district PD fits the indicator. Does district PD fit the indicator to a high, moderate, or low level? Discuss your answers with one another. What evidence supports your ratings? If there are disagreements among district leaders, what differences in perspective account for these disagreements? Incorporates coaching 
is sustained, is differentiated, supports collaboration, provides opportunities for reflection, is content focused, incorporates active learning, models effective practices, offers feedback. She changes the slide. Text, how number four. Provide resources to support relevant learning. One final set of practices for prioritizing teaching and learning relates to the allocation of resources to support district-wide professional learning focused on improving instruction. Most administrators know the expression, follow the money. Is it going to high-quality PD for educators? Is it going to high-quality instructional materials for students? Or is it going somewhere else? The money and other resources should, of course, go to what is most important. And prioritizing teaching and learning means meeting the learning needs of the students and the adults in the system. When the district properly resources learning opportunities for the children and the adults, there are a number of positive outcomes. One, children and adults realize that the district wants to see them prosper. Two, Everyone is provided with the tools they need in order to accomplish the tasks they have been given. Three, teaching improves and learning improves. She changes the slide. Several colorful charts and graphs showing percentages and pictogram men. Text, resource allocation is all about equity. Whenever resource allocation is underway, issues of equity are at stake. Why? The process of allocating resources requires decisions about who gets what. When they allocate resources to the highest priority needs and strategies, that is, to teaching and learning, districts have a chance to give the most to those most in need. Historically, though, schools across the U.S. have given the least to those with the greatest needs. Equity requires that the tables be turned. She changes the slide. Two rainbow-colored head silhouettes face each other. Text, turn and talk number four. The webinar concludes with one last turn and talk activity, this one about equity. You might want to stop the video and talk with one or two partners. Two questions should help you think about relevant issues. One, which subgroups of students receive instruction from the least qualified educators? That is, brand new educators, educators without full licensure, educators without adequate content preparation, paraprofessional educators, and educators whose principals judge them to be weak. How can the school district reallocate staff so that the subgroups of students with the greatest needs receive instruction from the best qualified educators, that is, those with several years of experience, those with full licensure and excellent content preparation, and those whose principles judge them to be excellent. She changes the slide. Text, summing up. As the turn and talk activity may have revealed, students with the greatest learning needs do not always get the highest quality instruction, but improvement efforts can change that. Districts can allocate staff, funding, and other resources more equitably so that excellent instruction is assured across the entire system. Improvement work heading in this direction requires districts to use four key practices. One, focusing goals and strategies. Two, involving administrators as lead learners. Three, providing staff with multiple opportunities to learn. And four, providing resources to support relevant professional learning. Thank you for taking time to consider the practices used by districts that have been shown to improve performance and equity by prioritizing teaching and learning. She changes the slide. A photo of four students in a classroom, one of whom has a tracheal tube. Text, Ties Center is supported through a cooperative agreement, number H326Y170004, with the Research to Practice Division, Office of Special Education Programs, U.S. Department of Education. Project Officer, Susan Weigert. Opinions expressed herein do not necessarily reflect the position or policy of the U.S. Department of Education. The National Center on Education Outcomes, NCEO, leads the TIES Center Partnership. There are six additional collaborating partners.
Arizona Department of Education, CAST, University of Cincinnati, University of Kentucky, University of North Carolina Charlotte, and University of North Carolina Greensboro. Logos, NCEO, National Center on Educational Outcomes. Arizona Department of Education. University of Cincinnati. University of Kentucky. CAST, Until Learning Has No Limits. The University of North Carolina, Greensboro. UNC, Charlotte.